move on to uh, Jared Glickstein and Sumayajit Mandal from the University of Florida, who are presenting electromechanical ELF or ELF transmitters for wireless communications in conductive environments. Hello, my name is Jared Glickstein and I'm a PhD candidate with the Department of Electrical Engineering at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. My advisor is Professor Sumyajit Mandel, who's currently with the University of Florida. He was invited to give a talk at HamSci 2020, but due to the move to an online format, I'll be talking about our work in the e-poster session. Wireless communication in conductive media is limited by the short skin depth of electromagnetic radiation in solids. The skin depth is inversely proportional to frequency, which motivates the use of extremely low frequencies, or ELF, for transmission through such media. However, electrical antennas are inefficient at low frequencies due to their long wavelength. Take, for example, the US Navy's Project Sanguine transmitter, which operates at 76 and 45 hertz using two 14 mile long dipole antennas and consumes an incredible 2.6 megawatts of power. We replaced the conventional electrical antenna with a permanent magnet to achieve high field generation efficiency. In the functional prototype of figure two at the top of the second column, we use a diametrically polarized neodymium alloy magnet attached to a rotating shaft. In our transmitter, no power is consumed for field generation. The only sources of power consumption are to modulate the field to transmit signals and to overcome mechanical and electrical losses. The prototype consumes a nominal 12 watts of power during transmission. Please note our prototype does not include the same field strength as Project Sanguine and operates at different carrier frequency, so this is not a direct comparison. The prototype operates at 100 Hz using a form of continuous phase modulation, or CPM, which we developed to adapt to the restrictions of driving a system with mechanical inertia. We modeled the trade-offs of a mechanical communication system and found that the optimum number of symbols in terms of power efficiency is 7. So data is encoded using 7-ary Continuous Phase Frequency Shift Keying, or CPFSK. I developed an encoding scheme which allows transmission of the letters A through Z and some limited special characters to add some spice of life. And this is shown in figure 3 at the bottom of the second column. The receiver is a simple loop antenna with a low noise preamplifier followed by a lock-in amplifier to demodulate to baseband. To test the system, data is transmitted through a wall onto the floor above our lab. And at the top right of our poster, this cartoon shows the position of the transmitter and the receiver for these experiments. I collected data on the receive side without the lock-in amplifier to show the conditions of the ELF channel. If you could please direct your attention to the bottom left side of our poster, the spectrogram in figure 1 shows the data transmission and the carrier at 100 Hz, as well as power line harmonics which are strong sources of interference. I added two twin T notch filters at 60 and 120 Hertz to reduce this effect. However, in increasing receiver gain, we'll eventually reach a limit at the next harmonic. This factor motivates moving to a higher frequency where power line harmonics have lower power. With consideration to bit error rate, I was unable to experimentally observe more than one bit error out of a thousand, so I can't make any conclusion regarding BER from experimental data. Instead, I applied BER models for known CPM schemes using the measured field and calculated receiver sensitivity in the channel. This is shown in figure four in the third column of the poster. In the figure, I compare the performance of our receiver at the left side to the present state of the art on the right side, which is the awesome instrument developed by Morris Cohen. With our receiver, I expect to see effective data transmission at distances up to 10 meters away, and with the state-of-the-art receiver, I expect the communication channel with our same transmitter is effective at a distance of up to one kilometer away. The next iteration of design will use a much larger magnet and a state-of-the-art receiver. Some details of this as compared to the prototype are shown in the rightmost column in Table 1. The next iteration will implement a more power efficient motor and replace ball bearings with air bushings, which are effectively frictionless and will improve power efficiency. Our goal is to also achieve effective data transmission at distances of over one kilometer. At higher transmit frequency, receiver sensitivity will increase and sources of noise will be of lower power and easier to reject. In terms of applications for this system, we've explored applications in communication through conductive media, our proposed applications of interest include bidirectional communication with submarines and from caves to the Earth's surface for search and rescue missions. Other applications which might be of interest to HAMS 
includes the study of the ionosphere and a field propagation to the Earth's surface. In addition, the FCC doesn't regulate frequencies below 9 kHz, which makes for some interesting potential applications in enabling private communication, as you could encrypt data in any means desired. If you're interested in learning more about our project, please refer to further reading at the bottom right of the poster. We've recently published an IEEE access about the prototype transmitter. Thank you. All right. That was wonderful. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Well, I'll pop up here. Um, at that frequency, is it possible to um, have a synchronous um, transmit receive link where the transmitter and receiver are linked to something like a GPS time base so that it would help um, uh, phase coherent um, um, detection and demodulation might help um, extend the range dramatically. Uh, I mean, if you have access to a GPS signal, then, then sure, yeah. Um, in terms of more RF denied environments where uh, you have any wireless signals available, but yeah, if you have a GPS, then yeah, you can definitely synchronize. Uh, I mean, our data rates are, are at these frequencies are very low, so um, yeah, only modest amounts of timing synchronization probably required, you know, at the millisecond level. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I should mention that uh, this was our, uh, is actually funded by the NSF. I mean, we put that in the poster. So and thanks to the National Science Foundation for funding this. And uh, I think there's somebody wants to make a comment. Uh, I, I think Bob Melville was going to try to make a comment. Um, Bob, I, I don't, is can Bob you on? Yeah. Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, just, just a historical note here, vaguely relevant. I thought that was a very, very clever presentation. Uh, I wonder whether the uh, authors are familiar with the classic Mandelstam Papalexi experiment. This was an attempt to make an electromechanical high voltage generator along the lines of a Van de Graaff generator. But what they did was to take a inductor, hook it up to a mechanical variable capacitor, hmm. and rotate the capacitor at twice the resonant frequency of the network. And you generate uh, enormously high voltages. The, the, this was done like 19, circa 1937. And the experimenters reported that eventually the cable, the, uh, the inductor blew up because the field became so large. Just, just, just a comment. That the modern version of that is a way to generate an electromagnetic pulse in which you place a large current through an inductor and then crush the inductor with chemical explosives. The inductance goes to zero, therefore the voltage must go to infinity. And you can get something like an atomic bomb effect with conventional explosives. Just, just, just vaguely relevant to what you're doing. I thought this was very, very interesting and fascinating. Thank you. Oh, I will, yeah, I thank you. I wasn't aware of that. Um, I will look it up. Uh, yeah, Mandelstam Papalexi is a very classic. Okay. It, was in the, it led to the idea of a parametric amplifier. But yeah, it's right, purely right. electromechanical. Mm. I mean, I should mention that recently there's been a lot of interest in this topic. There's been papers published in high profile journals like Nature, for example, where people are talking about electromechanical transmitters. Uh, but they're generally doing smaller versions with um, sort of cleaner, cleaner things which can move with magnetic restriction effects like that. Whereas we are going for a more traditional heating motor sort of approach. Uh, I think we can generate higher powers that way. Uh, but of course, yeah. it's more limited compared to what... Uh, well, the, the original, you know, uh, sort of MF transmitters on ships were electromechanical alternators. Yeah, the Alexa and the Alexanderson, right? The, I'd like to know what kind of what frequencies that got up to. Maybe 100 kilohertz or something. I just don't know. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, th this is this is Phil. I know the Alexanderson alternator Alexanderson, in, Grimsby, yeah, yeah. in Grimsby, Sweden, is still there, it's and still they, there's a bunch of volunteers to keep it operational. And I think once a year, if I remembered correctly, at, at some time at uh, Christmas time, they actually get on the air and send some yeah. stuff out and, and receive reports. It's amazing. It's, what frequency? It was. It's maybe. It's maybe 17 kilohertz, somewhere in that range. Wow. Yeah. 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 17.2. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yep. Yeah. Oh, geez, I remembered. Yeah, it's literally a mechanical wheel with two with teeth, such that when you you know, but you, it's literally mechanically generating the the frequency. Um, you know, I, people who were associated with General Electric and other kinds of things, kind of up to a certain point, figured that that was the way you were going to be doing your transmitters, until people figured out other. What's, what's the power output? Any idea of this thing? Oh, should be a lot, I imagine. It's it's pretty it's pretty large. Yeah. Um, I'll try to find out. Who who listening remembers dynamotors? Yeah. <laughs> the world's most inefficient DC to DC converter. Anyway. Yeah. It's. Uh, yeah, the Alexanderson transmitter was about holy mackerel. Okay. Um, the driving motor is 370 kilowatts. Um, wow. Yeah. The supply voltage is 2.2 kilowatts. Yeah. I'm 2.2 kilovolts. So, yeah, it's big. Oh yeah, here we go. Um, yeah, the, it's a, actually it's 80, 80 to 100 kilowatts, but still quite impressive. Um, if you put in Alex, it's Alex. I'll put the uh, I'll put the address in the in the uh, comment. It's quite something. Well, I, I have a long-standing interest in. Parametric amplifiers. So, if somebody mm -hmm. wants to attempt to, to, uh, re, to reinstate the Mandelstam papal XI experiment, they could talk mm -hmm. about it. Maybe. maybe you can turn this into a practical technique. I don't know. What a who to revive something from 1937 and make it useful again. So. Um, there was um, there were two uh, uh, quick comments that I wanted to make. Um, the um, uh, I, in, in the poster, um, he was talking about how he, um, he used a uh, notch filter to uh, notch out 60 hertz and, and the first harmonic. Um, in, in VLFRX tools, um, a, 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 a tracking notch filter is, is used because it has to track the mains frequency because it's, it's not constant over time depending on load. So there's a uh, a tracking notch filter, and it also filters out um, up to like uh, um, 16 kilohertz of harmonics. Uh, so it's a, it it actually works pretty well, and and that could be a good technique. And the other thing that I wanted to mention is 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 for VLF transmissions in the Dreamers band, um, uh, what is required is a rubidium frequency standard to be in input um, into the uh, sound card as well as um, uh, and and the output is uh, fed into the uh, power amp. So um, uh, for for it to actually work, uh, it it needs to be tied to a a, a very accurate uh, frequency standard. So GPS would work too. I mean, the filter you mentioned is a software filter, right? Uh, the tracking filter you mentioned. It's, uh, it's after, after acquisition. The filter. Yeah, the, the uh, um, it's a tracking filter, filter, filter is implemented uh, after the signal is yeah. uh, okay. um, time stamped. Yeah, no, ours is a hardware filter. It's just to prevent the, the receiver from saturating. Uh, we can definitely put more filters after that once the data has been acquired. But this is just to prevent this high gate receiver from saturating with the uh, power line. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thanks for the comments. We've got four more minutes. Does anybody else have any other questions? Our next. Uh, maybe I just briefly mentioned. Jared didn't mention, but our next. Our uh, goal here is to synchronize several of these transmitters and do more complicated modulation schemes with them. So right now we're building, I think, four or five of them. And the goal is to synchronize them and have them run at different frequencies to do multi-carrier sort of modulation schemes like OFDM. Um, and that's the goal for the next few months. Okay. All right, thank you.